Well, hello, my name is Sats and you're joining us here today at C3 Reflect. And today we are talking about how do Christians pray? Hey church, how are you doing today on this fine Sunday? I hope you are uh, having a great week and uh, thanks for tuning in today, being a part of these few moments uh, here at C3 Reflect. If we've not had a chance to meet, my name is Sats, my wife Emma and I are the lead pastors here at this church, this congregation uh, based in London. Uh, we've got two locations in person in the Docklands, East London, and also uh, Southwest London in Balham. So hey, we'd love to invite you to come hang with us if you've not already. Um, but uh, we're in this series called The Science of Worship, and uh, I'm really enjoying it, just exploring uh, some of the design of God about how we relate to him. You know, I realize that God is not a chaotic God. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a mysterious part about who God is that is just like the awe and wonder and glory of, of God. But, you know, God is a God of order. When you look at the, the world around us, everything's held in this beautiful tension. Just the right amount of oxygen and nitrogen and in the atmosphere. And, uh, you know, the, the, the ozone uh, layer is protecting us from harmful rays and gravity just at the right amount. It just feels like to me that God is very precise um, in how he organizes things. And I really believe there are some principles about how we as human beings relate to God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And that's not to make us feel kind of trapped uh, by, you know, religion or just, you know, that sense of being a bit worried about getting it wrong. Um, I think we can kind of just approach God as we are. And I think that's pretty cool. But I do also think there are some principles that are going to help us um, in following Jesus and in, in uh, fo yeah, following him and talking to him and experiencing what he has um, for us. And so today we're talking about how do Christians pray? Uh, we're talking about prayer and we're talking about, um, yeah, just, just the, the power of your mouth, the power of your words and how they're related to your will and your desire. And, and what, why do we pray anyway? What, what's all that about? <laughs> so we're going to dig on to, into all that in just a few moments. Um, but if you haven't had a chance um, to do so yet, please let me encourage you to hit subscribe um, on the YouTube channel and um, you can yeah, keep getting this content coming your way uh, throughout the week and every Sunday. At 10 a.m. We're, we're premiering, so um, you can jump on that. And also, if you are brand new and you, you kind of would like to kind of just take a next step, well, why don't you jump on our mailing list? Um, we put out just high quality, encouraging, helpful stuff via email, as well as just connecting you with stuff that's happening in the life of the church. So you can go to our website, which is c3reflect.church slash connect, and uh, you can get connected. We won't spam you, and you can unsubscribe whenever you like. So it's it's all good. Uh, well, hey, let's jump into the message right now. And I want to start by reading you a passage of scripture, which is in Genesis 12. And a bit of backstory, um, you may have heard of a guy called Abraham in the Bible, who is like the, the ancestor of, of the Jews. And a long time ago, um, God, for whatever reason, chose this guy called Abraham, or he was actually called Abram at the time. And this is, this is what it says to him in, in Genesis 12, when, uh, right at the start of his story. It says, now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And this is what he says to him. He makes him a promise. How awesome is this? Imagine getting this promise. He says, and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Verse three, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. And uh, if you know the story, Abraham decided to do what God said. <laughs> he left where he was. He set out. And uh, that's really just kind of the main story that we read about in the Bible all the way through the Old Testament. Um, Abraham and the nation that he becomes, the nation of Israel, um, being God's chosen people, his instrument to bless the world, that they would be blessed 
but ultimately God's heart was always to bless all people. So, you know, it's a big question. Does God have favorites? Well, maybe we'll save that for another message. But what I do know is, is that, 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 that they were chosen to be a light in this world. And ultimately, that through Jesus, who was a Jew, in case you didn't know, um, the Messiah who would come and unite all people in himself, that the people of Israel were given the law and, um, you know, but it was impossible to follow. It was always beyond any human being to fulfill the perfection. And that's what Jesus, of course, came in. And so I just love God's heart for you and I, as we jump into this moment together, you know, can I just encourage you and let you know um, that God's heart has always been to bless you. Um, he doesn't have an agenda. He doesn't have like, uh, there's no horrible secret. There's no, um, you know, just uh, his heart is pure and is good. And he wants relationship with you and he wants you to be blessed. And now, now this is what we read, read about about Jesus. Jesus himself says these words in, in John 15, and, and he begins to describe um, how we experience that blessing that was promised to Abraham all of those thousands of years um, ago. And, and Jesus says this, he says in verse one of John 15, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse five, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing <laughs> as well. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, that's an important verse there in verse seven, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Well, that's a crazy promise right there. <laughs> that's amazing. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So there's this amazing passage of scripture as Jesus is helping us understand in the New Testament, um, that, that how blessing works. It's all about relationship with him. And, and this is the, the metaphor that he uses he is, is all about a vine or a tree, um, organic, uh, you know, matter. He, he says, look, you, you, you were just a branch. <laughs> it says, I'm the vine. I'm the source of life. And I want you to be included. I want you to draw from me. I want you to get everything that you need, every bit of life, because I want you to be fruitful. That's, again, God's heart is exactly the same. He's saying, look, my heart is that you would be blessed. My heart is that you would be fulfilled. My heart is that you would be fruitful. You'd have an impact. You would come alive. And all of that stuff, which sounds pretty good to me. But he says, look, that there is a mechanism. And, and the thing that's really interesting to me about this is you have to remember that J the audience of Jesus right here um, is a Jewish audience. These are the children or the great, 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 great grandchildren of Abraham in who are hearing this right here. So God's promise was first to the Jewish people. And, and Paul, the apostle Paul in the New Testament, he, he talks about how, um, you know, we as Gentiles, non-Jews, have been grafted in, grafted and in, included. I didn't, don't even know enough about plants to know how grafting works, but I think it's when you get added into the thing, you kind of a kind of a, a stray sort of branch over here and you, you get brought in and so that, that that life can flow into you. And it's, I imagine it's quite a science. I imagine it's quite a thing. And, and, and this is what Jesus did when he died on the cross and he, he paid the wages of sin, which is death, and um, giving up his own life, his own perfect life to pay that and redeem us so that we, not just the Jewish people, People, but also the Gentiles can be grafted into his vine. You know what I love about that church? Be because I, I just love that we've been grafted in, but we weren't first grafted in. <laughs> in other words, we were secondary, but we've been included. And I just find that such a, a, a powerful thought because I think so often when we read scripture, we read it through the lens of everything's about me. Everything's about me. I'm awesome. God's got promises for me. And, and you know, there's some truth in that. But, but we were secondary to God's chosen people, his, his vessel of blessing, the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, 
through which Jesus would come and every person would be included because of Jesus. But it just makes me grateful. It just makes me, uh, keeps me humble. It keeps me just in a sense of awe and, and, and just being thankful. Just being so thankful that I have been included. Hey, wherever you are at right now, can, can let thanksgiving rise in your heart as you understand that Jesus has made a way for us far off, disconnected, doing things on our own strength, living a life that is a depleted of strength, disconnected from God. We have been grafted in, included in this beautiful vine, the vine of life, Jesus Christ himself. We've been included, you and I. Um, right now, we can draw from that source of life. But here's what I find really interesting is, is that, that Jesus also describes branches that don't bear fruit. He says, you know, what? I want every person to be included. But he says, the thing is, though, is that there is a requirement that, that you draw strength from me. Um, you've got to be connected, not just um, tangibly, kind of practically, but you've got to actually actively, you know, a, a, a leaf or, or a stem coming off a plant. It, it draws moisture and everything that it needs from, from the root system of that planet. And if it doesn't, what you'll find is that it will begin to die. And it's always a sad moment, isn't it? And when you're houseplants where you've got this wonderful, strong kind of thing happening, it's this leaf coming off and it just you, you just kind of notice, uh-oh, I think it's starting to drop off. <laughs> I think it's starting to struggle. And eventually what you actually have to do is you have to cut it off because if you don't cut it off, because it's on this kind of infinite pathway towards death, it will actually drag the rest of the plant down unless you cut it off. And so you've got to cut it off so that, that the rest of the plant um, can be healthy. And that's what Jesus is describing here. He's saying, hey, you, you, you've been attached to the source. You, you're attached to me. You've been grafted in. But I'm expecting you to dig deep. I'm expecting you to, to grow in relationship with me so that you can um, actually experience this life, that this blessing and this promise that I gave to Abraham that was for you, that I gave to Abraham through the Jewish people and through Jesus, you have been included in the blessing of God. You see, I realize it's possible to be a Christian that is connected, but not produce anything of value. <laughs> it is possible. It's possible to be around for a long time. It's possible to grow up in church. It's possible to be culturally Christian. It's, a possi it's possible to, to have maybe the same morals as Christians, but, but unless you have an active relationship with Jesus Christ, you are going to find that eventually nothing good is going to come our way. Eventually life will begin to decay. Eventually fruitfulness when there's nothing to show for it, ah, man, Jesus wants you to succeed. Jesus wants you to be blessed, but everything flows from a relationship with God. So how does this relate to prayer? Because prayer is, is, is symbolic. It's not even symbolic. It is our relationship with God. Prayer is our conversation with God. If, if you're married to someone that you don't talk to, if you have a friendship, but you don't actually talk, <laughs> you don't have any conversation. You don't have any understanding of where each other are. You don't spend any time together. What sort of a friendship is that? What sort of, sort of a marriage is that? And sadly, that, that happens. But, but, but Jesus is saying, I, I want you to actually be in relationship with me. I don't want you to have a sort of, um, you know, just a distant acknowledgement that we are part of the same thing. He says, no, I want you to have an active, interactive, uh, conversational relational thing that, that we would not just have Jesus in our life as a, an item or an added extra, but he would actually become friend. He would actually become father. He would actually become um, just uh, close, close to us and intimate with us that we could talk to him and we could share with him. He's saying when, when you abide in me, when you have that sort of level of relationship, you're going to find that everything, everything fruitful will, will come from that place. And actually outside of me, he says, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. I love what it says in, in verse seven. I'll just read it again. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So I think sometimes when, when we pray, it, it's like it's like it's like we've known God for a long time. But but it's like, it's normally in those moments that we need something. Right. 
You know, in those moments of chaos or crisis where we reach out to God and God is faithful. So if you are in crisis, you can reach out to God. But it's a bit odd, isn't it? It's like when someone calls you out the blue and they call you, it's like an old family member and they call you up and you straight away, you know, they need something. <laughs> <laughs> they need something. And you know, your heart is always to help and bless. And But but you, there's still a strange feeling. There's still like a feeling that this is slightly outside of relationship. You know, if I were to just call someone up who I don't know and try to ask them questions, try to get advice or wisdom, try and get something from them. You know what? I didn't, I didn't even know if they're going to pick up my call, <laughs> let alone actually speak to me. But if I call up a friend, if I call someone I know and I'm in a hard spot or I'm thinking about a new venture, um, you know what? They're going to give me at least five minutes and say, hey, can we meet up? I'd love to ask you some questions about how you've done this. They're going to say, yeah, yeah, sure. There's, there's a relationship which has been built up over time, which gives me access to, to everything that relationship can bring. And God is not just about fruit. God is not just about success. Uh, God is about the relationship itself. And, and the best relationships are not about what we can get from one another. They're actually about the at each other. It's, it's about our interaction. And God is looking for that sort of relationship. So when we come to God and in worship, let's say, or um, and, and we, we don't, we, we're just talking to him in our head, because that's a common thing, right? Like silent prayer. And look, don't get me wrong, there is space for reflection and space and all of these kind of things. But you have to understand that, that prayer is not silent. Pr conversation that is silent. I mean, sometimes my wife wants me to know what she's thinking of. And I'm generally pretty bad at it. <laughs> I can't read minds. I do tell her. But, but, but like, like, that's not a proper conversation. But, but, but conversation is, it's got words. It, it's got, it's got share, sharing and sharing experiences. And actually, as Jesus says here, you've got to abide before you ask. He says, I want you to ask. I want you to call upon me. I want to be your father. I want to be your provider. I want to open up miracles in your life. I want to cause you to become incredibly fruitful. But he says, first, you've got to abide. You just got to invest in this relationship. If you don't spend any time with prayer, in prayer with Jesus, I don't know if you've got much of a relationship with him at all. Because prayer is conversation. And if you don't talk to someone, you probably don't have much relationship with them. Don't, don't forget that we are made in the image of God. So some of the things that we see in human relationships are actually, uh, they're, not, they're not first human, they're actually first divine. They've come to us from God. And God wants to relate to us in conversation, uh, not because that's how we do it, but that's because he's a relational God. We enjoy relationship because God is relational, because we're made it reflecting his image, not the other way around. And so when we come to prayer, we need to be reminded that, that, that actually God wants to talk. <laughs> God wants to spend time with you and I. And if we can make a discipline and if we can prioritize because that's what it's about. You make space for the things that matter. So if God is important to me as a person, not just as a sugar daddy, not just as provider, but, but that I genuinely want to know him, I want him to know me, that I genuinely want to spend time with him, that, that I don't just appreciate him and be grateful for him, but I actually love him. I love him for who he is. Then, then we're gonna find that out of that place is gonna be a place of power. Out of that place, the power of God is going to be revealed. And Jesus says, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And I think sometimes when we approach prayer, we can feel so frustrated. Just feeling like, what's the code? What's the formula to make this thing work? I, I've prayed here. You know, sometimes I realize we're praying for things and God's just like, oh, I don't think you really meant to ask for that. <laughs> it says, don't, don't ask until you've abided. And so a lot of our prayer just, I, I think it just gets redirected because we're asking for the wrong thing. Say, God, please send me a boyfriend. <laughs> God, please send me a girlfriend. Well, well if, if we were to take some time to abide, we would understand that, that, that there are other things we need to be asking. God, help me understand the issues of my heart. God, help me understand where things went wrong in my last relationship. <laughs> you see, God wants to answer the desires of your heart, but he wants to do it for a relationship where, where we're abiding, where we talk through the issues, where we talk through the stuff on our heart. God, help me to become the sort of person that is gonna stay married for life. Help me to be the sort of person, because guys, I don't know if you know this, but when you get married, we've been married 12 years. 
And uh, it's, it's not that long, <laughs> but it's also long enough. And I can tell you that when the excitement fades of you're dating and you don't have any kids and you know you can travel all over the place, when the excitement will fade of the awesomeness that is that season. And don't get me wrong, I love being married. It is wonderful. It is a gift. But you're, you're essentially just living not just, but you are living up close and personal with a person, seeing all of their flaws exposed and, and they know you and they know how to irritate you. I'm really good at that. They, they, know how to, they know how to press your buttons and they have a will of their own. They have a mind of their own. They're not gonna do everything you wanna do. You are gonna disagree. You're gonna get into arguments and it's okay because this is what marriage is. But, but what we're gonna find is that, is that God is so much interested in the whole process. And when we come to prayer and we're just asking for things, God, give me this. God, give me the promotion. Yeah, but are you, are you, are you ready to sustain the responsibility that promotion will bring. Uh, God, I just, I just wish I could go there. I just wish I could be there. Yeah, but are you, are you, do you have the, the strength and the capacity? Because what you're going to find is that all of this time that nobody sees when you are talking to Jesus, where you are abiding, that is the stuff that gives you the strength to sustain the ask. So you can ask for things and God will say, yeah, you are ready for this thing. Why? Because you are spending time abiding, abiding first, asking second. God wants to bless you. His heart has always been to bless you. Just as his heart was through the people of Israel, just as it was fulfilled through Jesus Christ, your savior, your Messiah, his heart has always been to bless you. But but everything flows out of relationship. And Jesus says, I, I want you to abide. Don't cheat the process. Don't, don't think of prayer as something weird and spiritual. It's, it's normal. It's earthy. It's relational. Sometimes it's a bit awkward, just like normal relationships. When you meet someone for the first time, you're meeting a new group of friends, you, you've got to get over those first hurdles. And maybe for you today, you just feel like, this whole topic of prayer, you've heard so many people preach on it. Uh, you, <laughs> you've heard everyone talking about it. it's important, you get it. But if you're honest, as you look at your, your relationship with God, it feels like you don't even know where to start. <laughs> where do I even go? Or maybe it just feels like you've, you've kind of been disconnected. You know that in that relationship, it's been some bridges that you've burnt. It's been some decisions where you've turned your back on that conversation. You're going to say, God, I appreciate your input, but I want, to, I want to be in charge right here. I want to be the vine. And you've come to the end of yourself, literally. When the branch tries to do its own thing, it's disconnected from the source. And we all know what happens to a branch that's disconnected from its source. It gets dry, gets brittle, it gets tired, and ultimately is destroyed. And I just know God's heart for us today is that wherever we are, that we would take this relationship with Jesus Christ seriously. And that's what I wanna challenge you on today because I know God wants to bless you. I know his heart for you is good. I just know that before we ask, before all of the blessing of God comes, before all of the calling is fulfilled, before God opens up your world, everything begins with a revelation that he is the vine, he is the source. So, so how do we pray? Let's, let's just talk about that for a moment because it says, abide in him. It says, whatever you wish, it will be done. Let's read that verse um, again. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. So here's your key to, to, to understanding how to pray. What, what happens is we abide in Jesus. That's about our decision to take time to create space for him. And as we create space for him and we read his word, those, those words are going to abide in us. So we're abiding in Christ, but Jesus is the word. So he says, as you abide in me, my word, the Bible, as we abide in the, those words, those words are going to start to live in us. And we're going to find that they're going to shape how we think about life. They're going to shape how we think about what we ask for, what we request. They're going to become our framework for how we view the world. The lens, our worldview is going to be formed by scripture, not by culture. So when there's a clash between what culture says and what the Bible says, we're going to make the decision, he's the vine, and I'm going to have to implement that. Now, now what, this is what's so powerful about prayer, right? Is that your, your words are connected to your will. 
Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the mouth is connected to what's going on on the inside. Now, before, outside of Christ, we we're disconnected. So we're just, you know, the, the, the heart is, there's nothing good there. <laughs> it's actually what Jesus says. It's pure evil in a heart outside of Christ. But what we find is that when we're connected to Jesus, it's like there's a new heart. There's a new spirit on the inside of us. And we can begin to draw uh, near. We've been given new hardware, but we still have to program the software and to work with the new hardware. Otherwise, we're going to get really frustrated. It's like trying to put, you know, I don't know, we're like we're trying to work with floppy disks uh, with our smartphone. It's just some of you don't even know what floppy disks are, but <laughs> but it's an old piece of piece of hardware. And so, and so uh, the, the way that we uh, program our thinking and, and align ourselves and get the words of God into us is actually to pray the scriptures is to speak scripture. And so we're reading, I am the true vine. So as we're praying, what we need to do is we need to begin to just spend some time to meditate and really think on that verse. And we begin to do that by actually saying it, by speaking it out, out loud, not just thinking in your head, hmm, Jesus is the true vine in my inner voice, but I'm actually uh, b- beginning to say, you are the true vine. God, I acknowledge that you are the source of life. And I choose right now, God, I want you to be the source in my life. I know that I've relied on me, myself. I've been the vine in the past or I've tried to be, but God, I'm choosing right now. I want you to be the vine because you are the true vine. Okay, that's just an example, right? Of of what you might do is you're reading the scripture and it's a bit awkward, it's a bit fumbly, but you're gonna find as you speak that, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be connecting yourself to the source of life and the word is gonna give you life on the inside and that's gonna strengthen you, it's gonna encourage you and you're gonna find that as you're praying, you're gonna begin to get things that you need to ask for. So you realize there's something in your life that is not truly connected to the vine. So you say, God, I pray, I wanna lay down this part of me. God, this addiction over here, God, this relationship over here, give me the strength, give me the courage. And we begin to ask for the things that God is gonna say yes and amen to everything that you ask. And this is why we feel so often like prayer is powerless is because we don't go through this process. We don't read the Bible. We don't read the scripture. We just cry in a time of need and God is faithful and good and kind. But there's a whole, whole thing here. So how does this relate to worship? Because as we come and we worship God, guess what we're doing? We're using our mouth. We're declaring scriptures through the songs. We're making declarations. And so it's so important in these moments that we don't, um, you know, we don't just think, oh, this is just kind of like the worship leader or whoever is trying to get me to do something, that we actually understand that, that this is an opportunity for us to engage engage the will and, and through the power of our mouth to, to use our words to, to, to align and to abide and say, Jesus, my life is yours. Jesus, I declare your goodness. Jesus, you are the true vine. You are the true north in my life. And to align ourselves to Jesus Christ. And Jesus says that those sort of people, people who live with that sort of relationship are gonna be incredibly fruitful. They're gonna have a great impact. They're gonna be blessed. And church, I want that for you today. I want you to to, to come as you are to Jesus and to wherever you are on the journey, to start or restart that journey with no judgment. Just know that God wants this for you. The first thing he does is not going to tell you off. I suspect you've already done that on his behalf. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to welcome you. When the prodigal son came home, he was expecting a big telling off. He was expecting, man, I'm going to get it. I just, I, maybe I can just be a servant, but the father comes, puts the robe on him, puts the ring on him, gets the party going, cooks the meat. It's, it's awesome. It's a celebration. And I hear heaven celebration right now for a whole heap of people right now that are coming to Jesus, coming back to Jesus. This is what it means to follow Jesus is to be connected in relationship, to become a friend of God, to become a son, a daughter of God. He's your father. He loves you. Gosh, well, there's just one thing we need to do now. And some of you need to make that decision right now. So I'm going to pray a prayer with you and you can use your mouth and you can make this declaration as well. Just say it back. Um, make this your prayer um, right now from connect your heart to your will, to your mouth and declare right now. So let's pray this prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm here just as I am. I want to be connected to you. You are the vine, and I'm just a branch. I need you. Will you receive me today? My life, I make you king, 
and I choose to follow you. Amen. You know, I, I pray that prayer like all the time. I'm praying that prayer every day. I'm just like, Jesus, I give you my life. Um, it's a great prayer. Um, it doesn't mean we're getting saved again necessarily, but it means we're repositioning ourselves. Um, so wherever wherever you are, if you're praying that prayer, how can you just let us know? Let us know in the comments. Um, let us know so that we can cheer you on and make the decision to be connected into the house of God, the church of God. Uh, because uh, here's how the analogy goes. There's branches and uh, those branches are all together tied into the vine. So this part of God's design for us um, is to be together approaching God as well as personally um, in community. And so that's why gathering is so important. So I'd love to invite you to be a part of that. Thanks so much for, for joining us today. And uh, I'm going to pray one more time that God's blessing um, and favor would be upon us, that, that as we go out, that we would not just be a church that, you know, um, has an impact, kind of just a small, shallow impact, but that would really truly be fruitful and be beacons of light in our community. So God, I pray for every person right now. I thank you so much that you want to use them uh, to impact this world. We pray, put influence upon them. God, for every person, and I pray, God, break every chain of condemnation where people feel disconnected. God, I thank you that they can be connected right now through their decision. And I pray, take down every barrier that stopped us from feeling connected. God, cause your blessing, your face to shine upon every person watching today. We pray in the name of Jesus. Thanks for joining us today, guys. God bless you. We'll see you soon.